Today in the studio, folks, like every other day, I've got a real treat for you, Dr. David Boyd, especially, folks, if you like to be healthy, Dr. David Boyd in the house. What's cracking? What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Now, David has a company called Blind Spot Medical. I like the name Blind Spot. Thank you. Blind Spot Medical basically works with high-level individuals, maybe celebrities and athletes and whatnot, to really get deep almost at a cellular level. Yep. Look inside, look at everything to make sure people are actually as healthy as they feel and, and, and think they are. Now, a buddy of mine, Mr. Damon John, I wouldn't say buddy because we don't hang out that much, but friend of mine, Damon, he went and did an executive physical and found thyroid cancer. Yeah. And he said if he didn't do that executive physical, he would have major issues, if not be dead. So how, like, encouraging would you be for people to go get an actual executive, not just a physical, an executive physical? Yeah, very encouraging. And uh, so I didn't know you were friends with Damon. Uh, I actually, I met him at an event and he told me the exact same thing. And I think it was like actually like two years, almost to the, to the date um, that he had had that thyroid cancer discovered. So, um, and he, you know, and he's very public about it. I mean, it's, uh, they caught it at a stage where thankfully it wasn't too far along. So caught it at just the right time. And here's the thing, man, is that especially for, for guys, right? Like guys usually don't go to a doctor as it is, like unless there's a problem or like maybe if their wife like pushes them enough, they'll go and they'll do like an annual physical. But the annual physical that's done in your typical doctor's office is the same exact annual physical that was done in like the late 1960s. Like it really hasn't changed. Not nah, really. Really? Yeah. I mean, you think about it. It's like you get very basic blood work. You get your balls juggled, f fiddled. Yeah. Checking for any issues. Serious? Yeah. Still? It's the same thing. It's like the, it, it hasn't moved You don't get forward. a finger in your butt. I mean, if they're doing it appropriately, yeah. Still? Yeah. Dude, come on. There's yeah. no medical advancements? No advancements in that. And it's even worse because, you know, nowadays, average time with a physician is seven minutes. You wait in the waiting room for like 90. And yeah, see, you, I wanted to ask you about that too yeah. because, dude, I don't understand. Why don't doctors, when they tell you to be there at two o'clock... Be ready for you at two o'clock. Oh, dude. It's, I mean, that it's a big, it's a big issue. I mean, the, the nutshell of it is, is that most doctors are employed nowadays. Like even if it's their own practice, they're actually really employed by, by a, an insurance company. And, you know, they're constantly uh, getting less and less money for each patient that they see. So what they do is they ramp up volume. And so it becomes a volume game instead. So, Everybody wants to blame the doctor, which, you know, they, they could say, hey, I'm not going to play this game. And instead, I'm going to go cash base instead, which is a whole other, you know, whole other issue uh, for, for that business model to deal with. But the reality is, is that they're just adding more and more patients. So, you know, it used to be a busy day. You know, somebody would see like, you know, 12 patients. Then, you know, I'm, I'm 45. I've been a physician for over a decade now. So when I was going through my training, it was already ramped up like 25. And we're like, holy smokes. Now there's primary care doctors seeing like 40, 50 people a day, you know? And so they're barely spending any time. So they're just running through. But you think about that just for a second. Like if it's an assembly line type mentality, then think about the number of things that are missed, you know, you, and then or misdiagnosed or misdiagnosed, or you don't really have, like, there is no such thing as like a doctor patient relationship. You really don't get to know your doctor. How are you going to know somebody in seven minutes once a year? It's just, it doesn't happen. You know, no, you're a, you're a, you're a part of a process of yeah, business. Exactly. You're like a cow. Yeah. It's an assembly line. Heard it in there. It, precisely. And so with that, that's what people are trusting to like catch problems when they're small. Yeah. So inevitably, you know, things are going to get missed. So that's why, that's why, you know, for folks that really like view themselves as an asset, you know, and, and this is why I love working with entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs get this conversation. It's like, if you look at, if, if you step back and you realize you are your business, like you can have all these all, funnels and people working for you and all that, but you are the business. So if your health fails, then everything else is going to fail also. So once you're your. I'm waiting for one of those. Yeah, I was. Thank you. So once you, you make that recognition that you are your greatest asset, well, that's when everything changes and you go, okay, hey, wait a minute. Like, let me actually look and see what's going on here. 
And I yeah, think, even if it's scary. Exactly. See, there's a lot of people out there listening to this. They're like, you know, hey, I'll do that. Well, there's two, there's two reasons people stop. Number one, it's not 50 bucks. It's not really that expensive, but it's definitely not $50 checkup. Yeah. It's a, it's a deep dive mm -hmm. and you're staring down the barrel of mortality. Mm -hmm. Aren't you? Yep. Absolutely. And dude, some that, that freaks people out. Absolutely. Like, I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know. And then they're like, oh, I'm, I'm afraid to see what's wrong. Why? Cause they kind of do feel a little bit shitty sometimes. And you know, they do have a pain somewhere. Some, sometimes I got a bump right here. I don't know what the bump is. Probably did, a did I tell you about the bump? I don't think it so. It probably is a lipoma because I yeah. think a couple of doctors have already told me it's a lipoma. Yeah. I'm like, well, how, I don't know how you know, but I don't like it there. Yeah. And you know what's crazy? When I first got this, um, I can remember where I was. I was sitting at a kitchen table at, at a house I used to have. And all of a sudden it felt like there was a cigarette burn on my arm. Really? And I went, ow. And I went like this. And there was no bump at the time. Mm -hmm. It just was a sting, like a cigarette burn on my arm. It was the craziest thing. And then a couple of days later, I, w I was rubbing my arm and I went, what the hell is that? And right where that cigarette burn was, there's a little tiny bump. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like, is it getting bigger? Does it move? Is it like, is this cancer? Well, we can just ultrasound it, do an ultrasound. That way we have the exact dimensions and then we track it. And then like, what if it grows? Cut it out. Do lipomas grow? Yeah. Oh, well, then I ain't worried. Yeah. So it hasn't grown. They can. I mean, they, they lipomas, they're so. Um, now, you would have saw something on my blood work if I had cancer somewhere, right? Uh, only if I was looking for it, which I was. Were you? Yeah. I was. I would hope so. Yeah, I was. But there's the, the blood work that I do is also not your typical blood work. Um, would it be extensive? It, it Beyond extensive. Yeah, but you. But when you say not your typical, to me, your typical is they're just looking for this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. I'm looking for everything. Yeah. So that's just an extensive. Yes. But it's it's a typical uh, blood panel. It's just an extensive one. Uh, not exactly. So, and it goes back to kind of my my background and how I designed all this in the first place, right? So, so for example, when we're having a cancer conversation, there's a couple different ways to look at, at things that uh, would show cancer. So one is something that you may... Think of like the surface level that you may see with a typical um, just blood draw. Like you draw a CBC, complete blood count. If someone has like a bone cancer or something like that, then you're going to see some things that may come up in, in that panel. Um, that's kind of the surface level way, casting the wide net. Yeah. Right. Then you narrow it down even more. I look for cancer tumor markers, which is something that really nobody does. And that's because I have a background in the cancer space. I used to work at a major cancer center. I was one of their directors for, for years. I took care of all of the um, non-cancer issues. I was one of the, I was like the, the primary care doctor at, at the cancer center that would freed up the oncologist to then go work on just the cancers. So with that, when, as patients were going through different chemotherapies or what have you, then there's certain tumor markers that you follow to see if basically if the chemotherapy worked or not, you'd see a drop. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to have a baseline to initiate that. So what I do is I have a, I have a, a panel that I use that looks at a bunch of different tumor markers to see if anything's there in no, the first place. Good. Yeah, yours were good. See, folks, maybe you guys don't know this, but, you know, I went down and had the whole shebang done. Yeah. The whole shebang. I looked down the barrel of mortality. You did. And, uh, you know, came back with flying colors pretty much. Mm -hmm. There was only a few concerns. A couple things. Not even that big a deal, if you ask me, but... Mm -hmm. You seem to think one's more of a deal than I do, but well, I, I do. Is you are you cool to talk about but it? You, on can't, air? you can't do nothing about it. Well, that's not. But that's not true. It's not that you can't do. It's you at this stage. It's watching. It's making some changes. Yeah. Right. And then those. It's it's kind of like well, the changes assuming I was doing all these things. Like you say, don't drink. Okay. So, don't drink very much. Well, I don't drink hardly at all, if if at all. Yeah. Like I haven't drank in a long time. Perfect. So I don't drink. So you're already on the right I track. I was there. smoking cigars like yeah. some bitch. You yeah. said try to lay off those a little bit. You gotta lay off the cigars. Now which when, I mean now when you say lay off, is a celebratory cigar okay? Uh, dude, I mean I smoked a cigar with you. Yeah, because so, one cigar is not gonna do anything. No, and it but it's one of those things where if you start looking at it more of a macro level, zoom out, right? Where it's like, okay, let's say you're gonna have you're gonna smoke a cigar every New Year's Eve. Right. Well, over the course of the next 20 years, right, that's 20 cigars. That's not that bad, you know, in comparison to a guy who's smoking one a day. 
you know, or five a day, like I was, well, if it's five a day. Yeah. So if you're doing like, you know, a couple a year, that's pretty good. That's yeah, probably fine. But where we're going to actually really find the truth and have, and have the facts are in 12 months from now, when we rescan, why would, if that's too late, why aren't we doing it in six months? Because it doesn't typically change that much if you're typically. doing all those things. Yeah. 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 Which I mean, we're watching you. Blood pressure looks good. Looks great. Yeah. You've already like, you've, you've been on this fitness journey here for a while. Like you're super fit. You look great. Getting there. Yeah. But I mean, you're, you're already doing those things. So it's not that there's nothing to do. It's just that you're already doing them. Although I am implementing more of a carnivorous diet. Yeah, people are all so big on this whole carnivore thing. Dude, it just works. Like I'm, I, I'm already starting to see my face thinning out again. Like, yeah, dude, I, mean, I got in great shape. Then I pulled my arm. Yeah. And then, and then I'm like, okay, well, I'll just keep doing cardio. So I did cardio. I got down to like pretty lean to, to 11. Yeah. To 11. And then it seems like, you know, I took two, three days off and yeah. then bam, 225 again. I'm like, damn, 225 and like. Three, four days? Yeah, bro. It's because we're over 40. And then I started looking at the mirror, and next thing you know, my face was starting to get heavier, and then I started looking at my videos, and I'm like, dude, I'm not as lean as I used to be. Like, dude, what's happening? Yeah. Well, I was eating the rice, and I was eating good, but it, it, it was like, uh-oh. So I just eliminated carbs, and sure enough, carbs and sugar, man, and as soon as I eliminate those, I'm done. Yeah. All but, right. but can you stick to that? Yeah. Like, you're the type of guy that you can eat, like, a can of tuna every day, and that's... Yeah. Yeah, you're good. Because I look at it as fuel. But yeah. I prefer steak every day. Sure. Now, doctors will say, ah, you want to lay off the red meat. Is that a fact, or is that just opinion? Because one thing I under, I've, I've always wondered about doctors, mm -hmm. you guys can't agree on shit. Yeah. It's true. Okay, so who's who's right? Who you? Maybe you're wrong. Maybe they're right. Maybe they're wrong. Maybe you're right. Like yeah. who the hell is correct? So here, so here's the. This is can what, I eat steak or not? Yes, eat steak. But I'm, and I'm going to tell you why I'm right. Okay, so yes, eat steak. But like anything, everything in moderation. Yeah. You know that's why I tell folks two two, two strips a day. Th this well, I would say try to keep it to like you know like two three times a week max. You know steak steak. What else can you have then? Yeah, whatever you want. Steak. <laughs> Wait, except, well, but you got to vary it a little bit. And the reason why. Well, what about bison? What about hamburger? Like it says red meat. Like everything I like is red meat. You don't like chicken or turkey or fish at uh, all? It's not my preference, yeah, but I, mean, I, I get it. It's decent, but yeah. you know, I'd prefer, like if you said, Brad, you hungry? Dude, get me a steak. Why? Because I could dip it in A1 and freaking love what I'm eating. You showed me that trick of the A1 of the sour cream. Uh, that is a game changer there. Hamburger. Dude, I love hamburger. Yeah. Are you shitting me? Yeah. But now, turkey patties, yeah. Je Jenny O turkey patties. Yeah. Dude, they're they're good. They're pretty Throw good. Throw a little barbecue sauce. Sure. I, I, that's what I was eating today. Yeah. So like, you know, I can I can do turkey, but is red meat actually bad? I mean, based on studies that have been done, you know? And so this is right. There's like this big thing on carnivore right now, which is very gimmicky to me, you know? I because you can't sustain it? It's just because like, you know, it's like for, for folks, take a step back. And it's like, whenever, whenever something feels very salesy, you know, especially when it's a diet, yeah, but they're not selling you meat. They're just telling you to eat meat. Do you yeah. think that's the meat companies doing that? Well, but it's, it's not, it is instead. What it is, is the folks that are, they're saying, Hey, go all carnivore. And Oh, by the way, buy this glucose tracker that you like wear, or you see it on Instagram and such. Right. So here, so that way you can always know what your blood sugar is doing. It's freaking ridiculous to me. Like you don't always need to know what your blood sugar is doing. Yeah. You know, maybe if you're, if you're type one diabetic, that's an entirely different story. But for you and I, like our, our pancreas handles that just fine. We don't need an external pancreas digitally like stuck to us. So now instead what it's doing is it's selling a product. And that's what I mean is if it's something that it's like here, here's this information. I'm going to wrap a little bit of fear around it, but guess what? What's the solution? This product. That's when you have to take a step back and go, mm, wait a minute. Am I just being sold to? Yeah. You know? So, so the whole like, keto thing, carnivore thing, all that. If you take a step back and you look at, and you don't have to, you don't have to just believe me saying this, like you can Google it and see, like if you take a step back and you look at all the different types of diets that there are out there, whether that's Atkins, keto, uh, Mediterranean, low fat, South beach, uh, carnivore after about 18 months. Yeah. Intermittent after about 18 months, then they all meet at the same line where you get pretty much the same result after about 18 months. So when folks tell me, well, what's the diet that I should stick to? My answer is the one that you'll stick to. So if that means that you're going to be like fitter, 
by eating red meat all the time. Okay, cool. Go ahead and go ahead and do it if that's what you'll actually stick to. But also understand without the decreased fiber, based on studies, it's been shown that without the increased fiber, there is a, a, a higher risk of colon cancer. And can't, such. You, can't you take a, a Metamucil or yeah. some sort of fiber sure. replacement? Yeah, which I do. I mean, that's, yeah. you know. Are you are you mainly meat? I do. Uh, I do mostly protein, a little bit of carbohydrate, a little bit of fat. And then if I have to, uh, like, what I do is I, I love food, man. Like, I'm a big foodie. Like, food's my drug of choice. So am I. So for me, it's like, I have to like structure it in where I have like a cheat meal and on that cheat meal, I'll do one cheat meal a week. And on that cheat meal, I've learned, I have to like cheat to the point where I'm almost sick, where it's like, I'll have like a cheeseburger and fries and you know what? Give me the milkshake. And you know what? Let's do pancakes with ice cream afterwards. I mean, just go freaking bananas on that cheat meal. Cause the reality is what most people don't know is you're only going to in one meal. I'm going to like say this very plainly in one meal, there's only so many calories you can absorb in a day that's different. So where folks will make the mistake is they'll do like a cheat day where they'll be like, have a 6,000, 10,000 calorie day versus a meal. Like what if it's a 10,000 calorie meal? You're only going to absorb so many. Yeah. You're only going to absorb so many. What like, happens to the rest? You, you poop it out. I mean, it passes. Like huh. there's only so much that your colon can do. I'll be down. Yeah. So that's what I've, I finally, I learned that works for me. And this may not be for everybody is you get to a point where it's like, okay, I'm going to have a big enough meal where I'm like, okay, this is, this is ridiculous. Then I've maxed myself out. And the next day I want to get back on the right track and I'll stay that way for, for solid for a week till it's time for my next cheat meal. And that works really well for me. Yeah. And the only way that I figure that out is I failed so many times at it. And then when you get to this point where you're like, you're, you're cheating on the, on the diet, which I don't want to call it a diet. It's really more so of a lifestyle that you're, you're, you're going and eating stuff that really doesn't serve you. And then afterwards you feel guilty about it and you feel shame about it and all that. And you know, I was just like, oh, I'm done with all that. So, so folks pay attention because number one, you are the weapon. What do you say? The, the, your body is your, your body is the weapon that, that really builds your business. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of people out there. They're burning the candle at both ends. They don't understand that one, one problem, one issue sets you back a long time could yeah. devastate you. And you can prevent that by simply getting the right physical. Yeah. Now blind spot medical. Why'd you call it blind spot? Cause it's exactly that. Like he just came to me one day. It's like, what we do is we look in, in, in people's blind spots. Right. Cause most, especially like most guys that are, you know, they're killing it. They're doing great. Like me. Yeah. Like you're a perfect example, right? So you're absolutely killing it. You're doing great. And then there's this area that you didn't see because it was in a blind spot. And so where, that, no, where if I would have went to a normal doctor, they probably wouldn't have said anything. Would have found it. If I, if I, I don't feel anything. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not hindered in any way. I don't have any symptoms. Blood test wouldn't show it. Blood I don't care how fancy the damn blood test is, it wouldn't show it. Like there's that, that's, that's one of the things that really gets me is that, you know, people are going to be wondering what I have. Well, we can talk about it if you want. Like that's, I, I can't I, disclose I, like it. Cause I, like I said, I don't, I don't care. I don't care what we talk about. But I mean, it has to be you that puts it out there. Like, well, again, I mean, I'm big on doctor patient confidentiality. All, all I know is it's, it's, it's nothing major in my, in my book. Mm -hmm. It could be major, could be, yeah. but it's not major. Yeah. But people are going to wonder. So let's leave them wondering for a little longer. Cool. Let's leave them I'll tell you at the end. There you go. I like it. That's good. But what I really want to move people to do is go get a damn blind spot executive physical. Now, not everybody's going to go rush down there and do it. But I know yeah. a lot of listeners and a lot of my guys are entrepreneurs. A lot of my people are entrepreneurs. Men, women, doesn't matter, right? Yeah, correct. And you've literally saved lives by having this procedure done. And you've definitely saved and enhanced businesses by doing it. Absolutely. What kind of changes does someone make once they get that, once they look down the barrel of mortality? So one of two things is what, I, what I've found is number one, if we find something, so if we find something, then usually that's when it's like, okay, everything stops. We're going to stop. We're going to deal with whatever this is. And, you know, fortunately, the whole point is we're trying to find things when they're small before they ever get out of control in the first yeah. place. Right. So, and that's the smartest part about it. If you ask me, dude, I mean, there's people that you, you led another five years of arterial buildup and you'd have a stroke, an, an aneurysm, a, what do you call it when there's a blockage and, and is that a stroke? 
Yeah, it's a stroke. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I mean, like, you, dude, you, you could be five years from a stroke, and all you'd have to do is, like, just make a few changes, and you wouldn't know it unless you went and had one of these deep physicals. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, case in point, and, you know, again, like doctor-patient confidentiality, I can't really say a lot about it, but we recently had a couple come through, a guy and his wife came through, and um, we found that she had a brain tumor. She didn't even know about it. You know, she would have like vague symptoms, little floaters here and there, a mild headache when she would, you know, get stressed out. They have little kids. So, you know, there's the stress of being a parent um, and had a brain tumor. So, I mean, there's, there's things that uh, when, when you find something, that's when everything stops and we say, okay, let's address this first and foremost and, uh, and then go from there. Right. So that's kind of like the one scenario. The other scenario is we don't find anything. And when I say don't find anything, it doesn't mean that it's not worth the time. Instead, more so, it's like, it's kind of like taking the pit bull off the chain. Like now it's like, okay, look, you've got pretty much a five-year guarantee that unless you get hit by a bus or, you know, a meteor lands on you or something, you've got five years. What do you want to build in the next five years? Because the majority of the folks that are coming to see me, they're, most of them are in there either like late thirties, early forties, fifties, something like that, where they've been an entrepreneur for a while. Like they know their craft very well. And they're at this point where most entrepreneurs, let's face it, like we're probably never going to retire, but you will get to a point where you kind of want to slow down, enjoy, enjoy everything that you've built, you know, hundred percent. Yeah. So it's, so instead it's like you realize that the next 10 years, the next 10 years are what's going to truly actually change everything because you have the skill set that you have now, you have the platform that you have now, and now's really where you're going to start doing things like making a legacy for your children, like going and investing in other people and their businesses and watching that change their lives and so forth. So right now is the most crucial time. And I've had, I've had multiple patients that they were already very successful, but once they got this stamp of approval, that's when something clicked. By the way, if you guys want to uh, try to schedule, learn more, go to workwithdrboyd.com. Workwithdrboyd, B O Y D D R. So drboyd.com. Workwithdrboyd.com. Answer a few questions, um, 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 learn a little bit more. And I would strongly suggest everybody goes and gets checked out. Yeah, thank you. Because I mean, what's, what's like, the, the craziest part is a lot can be avoided. Yeah. And a lot of people, if we could get them to move, we just saved a bunch of lives. Absolutely. Ultimately, and, and better yet, helped a lot of businesses. Because, dude, I'm telling you, when you walk out of there and you know you got a clean bill of health and you're, you're fired up, you're ready to go, then you obviously will also uh, optimize human biology you got with, with peptides, testosterone, HGH, whatever, whatever is the latest and greatest. Yes. Are you up on all the latest and greatest? Yeah. And so what do you think of stem cells? Uh, I think they're great depending on how they're used. What about peptides? I mean, they're it, so peptides. It's a, it's a big term. Like you name it, there's a peptide for it. So for example, I use GNRH peptide, uh, which is to help boost growth hormone levels. And I do it for a couple different reasons. Number one, like I like to be muscular. But number two is more so on the longevity side of things. You know, as we start to age, particularly men, our testosterone levels naturally drop, our growth hormone levels naturally drop. And I think folks, um, when they think of growth hormone, they just think of like growth or muscle mass or something like that. Think of it more on the longs of like on the reparative side of things. So if you go and you have a hard day in the gym and you're sore the next day, which is normal, You know, if your growth hormone levels have been optimized, you heal faster, you sleep deeper, um, you know, you're, you don't get sick as often. I mean, it's, there's all of these like benefits that come from, from from keeping things optimal. Is that your IGF one? That, so uh, insulin growth factor one is one of the ways to actually, it's a reflective of growth hormone. Yeah. That's why I check a baseline. So if someone's taking HGH, would that go up? Um, it can't, it will, but you also, when someone's directly on HGH, you actually check direct hor- growth hormone levels as well. The liver King who just got yeah. basically exposed. Of course, dude, he never fooled anybody with yeah, a brain dude, in Nobody head. gets that big from, come no. on. Like yeah. when I hear it, he's like, I know natural I'm eating liver. I'm yeah, like, shut like, the whatever, hell up, dude. dude. Yeah. That's a hundred percent steroids. Yeah. Yeah. But he says that it's only HGH, which I still don't believe. No. 
but how much HGH you got to take to get like that? Yeah, a lot, I'd say. And it's not just HGH. Yeah, that's, that's, Can't be. No. I mean, so that's he was using anabolic stuff, DECA and all this other stuff. Trend. But, yeah. You know, I mean. What do you think about those? Um, those are, those can be really, really rough on your liver. Like really rough. So I have, I have a lot of patients that were former like pro bodybuilders that, you know, when they were in their like twenties, thirties, they were doing all that shit. And, you know, once they hit like their late thirties, early forties, they're like, oh man, you know, what have I done? Yeah. And I mean, that's when you're checking like, you know, even basic labs and their liver enzymes are a mess. And, you know, so those things have a price to them. And the, I'd say the, the bigger price overall is like when you start thinking about cancer, what if there's, what if there's just uh, what if there's a cancer cell floating around that somebody doesn't know about? And there's not a bunch of studies that are tied to it, but it's, it's kind of logical if you think about it, if you're increasing growth on things in your body and there's a cancer that's there, what are the chances that that could increase cancer growth? I mean, it makes sense, right? So, you know, if you're, if somebody's going to optimize, have a professional do it. And I mean, and not just someone who says, I can prescribe you this stuff. Someone who's an actual professional and, and really knows what they're doing. Because what blows my mind is that people think more about what they put in their gas tank than what they put in their body. Mm. <laughs> I don't know why that is. You know, I've been taking my health seriously for not serious, serious, but pretty seriously for, I'd say, let's say six months mm -hmm. before that. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't ever round and obese. I don't have any pain. I'm not winded. I can, you know, I'm healthy. Yeah. Feeling. Yeah. Anyway. So it didn't matter to me. There's a lot of people out there like they're pretty good. You know, they're still, they're still uh, pretty good. You know, there's nothing wrong with them. They feel great. What do you, what do you say to those guys? I mean, those, those are the guys, like those are the guys that all of a sudden we, you find something and this is typical, man, especially with entrepreneurs. Why? Because, you know, they're, they're, they're making things happen in their business while they're trying to be like a good husband and good dad and pay attention to their family and so forth. And, you know, they're, they're going a hundred miles an hour all the time. So these are the same guys that like in their, in their twenties, they were like pounding caffeine, right. To like stay amped through the day. And then by the time they're in their thirties, they're still doing that. But now they're having like, you know, a, a couple of whiskey drinks at night so they can get to sleep so they can get up the next day and do it all over again. And before you know it, they're like hitting their forties and they're carrying extra weight and they're tired and the stuff that they were doing isn't really working anymore. So they're looking for the next thing. And so, the, and the weights marbled in behind their organs. Precisely. Yeah. That's why you see those guys with the big bellies, yeah. extended bellies, even if they have abs, they're out here. They're out there. Yeah. Is that why? Yes. Yeah, because of, of visceral fat, visceral fat and visceral fat is really dangerous because it basically insulates the inside of the organs like it packs around the organs and it increases all the inflammatory markers. And it's hard to get rid of. It is hard to get rid of. Yeah. Some people might say impossible, but I was told it's not impossible, but no. it's definitely hard. No, it's not impossible. It, it, it's going to, it's a long road. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. Now, now what about, um, so we just described the guy that, Hey, there's, I don't really feel like there's anything wrong with me. Yeah. Um, what about people that like have sleep disorders? Like what about the other ones that know there's something wrong with them? Yeah. But they've been to the doctor. Why would they, why would they go to you as opposed to all the doctors they've already went to? Like for example, um, my brother-in-law, mm -hmm. he's got some sort of issue. He goes to all the doctors. He just went down to the Mayo Clinic. Mm. They said, there's nothing, we don't see nothing wrong with you. And he's like, dude, there's something wrong with me. So next thing you know, boom, boom, boom. He's on pregnizone for years. He's got some sort of Crohn's or colitis yeah, or some poor shit. Guy. Yeah. But anyway, it's getting to a point where it's like, damn dude, he, he better stop taking that medicine. So those guys are out there. What do you say to them? Yeah. You, you, for it, it's a case by case type thing. But in general, I would say, you know, the conventional medical system is pretty fragmented. And so with that, it's pretty hard to have like a doctor that like it's supposed to be your primary care doctor that looks at all the different pieces of everything, kind of puts together the bigger picture. Because when you go to a gastroenterologist, right, they're just going to focus on the GI tract. That's their thing. You go to a cardiologist, they're just going to focus on the heart and the cardiovascular system. So it's really it's up to the primary care doctor to put all those pieces together. But like we said in the very beginning, like these are the guys that are spending seven minutes with you. Right. So, and, and quite frankly, again, I mean, they can't even agree. Yeah, it's true. I so, always tell people to get a second opinion. Would you? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Especially before a surgery. Like if you said, Hey Brad, it's time. I think it's time we go get that. Like all due respect. I want three s- totally unrelated. Yeah. Like in other words, don't say a word to anybody. I'm mm-hmm. going somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And I walk in and be like, Hey, what do you think? I want three, not even two three like if, if you said i you should this one says i shouldn't it's not like oh that's what i wanted to hear yeah no, no no i want another one yes. and i might even do four why because i want to know now if all four say it do it if if one says it and three say don't what do you do what if this one's right and these ones are wrong because the doctors are just like they can't agree themselves in most cases even in dentists like four out of five dentists recommend dentine. Well, what, what's the other guy? Yeah, what do the other guy recommend? Right. Why can't they get along? Why can't they agree? I think a, I think a, it, I think it depends on what it is, right? Like there's some things that the things that are black and white. Um, that's one thing. Would there's, you agree that? Would you agree that anybody with low testosterone should mm-hmm. replace their testosterone? No. It has to be with, with low testosterone. Yeah, it, it has to be for the right person, and I'll explain why. Okay. So for instance, um, there are, it it depends what degree of risk, everything, everything there's risk involved. You take a Tylenol, there's some degree of risk. It's very, very small, but there's some degree. So when it comes to testosterone, like the, the biggies that you look out for, it does put someone at a potential higher risk for blood clots because it can, it, it, it thickens your blood. Yeah, well, but but what does that mean? So that means like actually increasing the number of red blood cells. So it's like more traffic on the highway. And it usually happens slightly for every guy, but in some men it happens more so than others. And we don't really know who's going to be who. So that did you, means- Did you check my red blood cell count? I did, you're good. Good. Yeah. So so that that's number one is like you have to be willing, okay, are you willing to have like a theoretical increased risk of blood clots? I think most guys would say yes. What about if that's a guy who has like um, uh, a personal history of pulmonary embolism, blood clot in the lung, or DVTs, blood clot in the leg, and that person has low testosterone? Well, do you want to start testosterone on that guy? That's a harder call, you know? So this is where it becomes, and it's one of the things I love with, with what you said about going and getting a bunch of different opinions, because it becomes empowering for the patient. It's not the doctor really making the call. The doctor's role is to say, hey, I'm the specialist in this field, and I'm going to recommend to you, here's, you know, here's your options and here's my recommendation. Mm-hmm. Now you get to choose and go from there. Mm. So what if all the young fellas out there or young ladies out there, there's, they're young. Why would they need to check? It depends on the age group and it depends on the family history. I think everyone should get checked. And it depends on if their- If you can afford it, yeah, I would go get checked. Why? Because, dude, I'm telling you, to know what, you, to know what you're dealing with is better than to be unaware. Yeah. You can change a diet and, and, and save a life. You could literally change a diet that would have never changed had you not walked in the place and, and, and got a few pictures, got a few scans, took a little blood. Doesn't take long at all. By the way, I did it, guys. You, they pick you up in a- Frickin', they got a driver and it's all fancy and shit. And then, you know, it's a, it's not a doctor's office. You're not going to a doctor's office no. or a hospital. You're going to a, it's almost like a concierge experience. Yeah, intentionally. Blind spot medical. And by the way, dude, I know a couple of your quote unquote patients. Yeah. And the reason I say quote unquote, because it's alleged, you know, can't talk doctor privilege or whatever. Confidentiality. Yeah. HIPAA. Yep. The old HIPAA act. But I know a couple of them. They swear by you. They said, dude, like anybody that doesn't go, crazy. They can afford to go. Right. Now, I want to talk about the people that can't afford to go. They can't necessarily afford to go. What should they do? I mean, those are the folks that first, first and foremost, I would say they need to advocate for themselves because the healthcare system is actually working against them. And this is what- Pay attention, folks. This is what, uh, th- this is what fires me up, right? So- you know, when you when you consider that health insurance companies, this is a multi trillion dollar industry. Okay. That most folks that are employed, right, they're working their nine to five, they're having a couple hundred dollars a month taken out of their paycheck every month, right? With the just in case that they go need to go and use it. So let's say they go to like a typical doctor's office where they've already paid this money to an insurance company. And now they're paying a copay for something. And then somehow or another, like after like everything happens, they get like 
two months later, another bill for your like, I don't even know what this is for at this point. Right. So there's like this shell game almost that's constantly going on with these medical insurance companies, right? Where you never really know what you're paying and what you're paying for. Right. That's problem number one. Problem number two, what most folks don't realize is that God forbid something happens and they end up in the hospital. Your insurance company is going to do everything that they can do to not pay for shit while you're in the hospital or potentially even drop you. And how's that even legal? I don't know. I really don't. But I, you know, like if I pay you insurance the whole time I'm healthy. And then when I finally get sick, you're allowed to drop me. Bullshit. You think about it. So again, if you have a multi-trillion dollar industry that's doing that, then there's got to be like, you know, you know, backdoor stuff that's going on in order to you allow shit is. to happen when it's that level kind of money. It has to be. Yeah. And, and the doctor level, like you, you worked for a uh, hospital. You don't even know it. No, you're sitting there just doing your rounds, not even well, knowing a thing. Well, here's here's where I started figuring it out is when I would have patients that I was trying to discharge from the hospital that clearly needed to either go home or go to like a skilled nursing, not not like a nursing home, but like a like an acute care place for maybe like six weeks, do some physical therapy, get back on their feet so that they can then go home where I would run into an issue with some medical director, which is a doctor employed by the insurance company where they would say, mm, no, send them to a nursing home instead. Send them to a nursing home. This person's going to basically, it's like a filing cabinet where you're just going to wait for them to die. This is something that was totally functional. Like two weeks ago before they came in the hospital, you give them six weeks of physical therapy. They're going to be back on their feet. You know, why would I send them to a nursing home? Well, it's cheaper is the bottom line. And that was it. And so I would end up arguing with these freaking medical directors over and over again. And uh, eventually I got to the point where uh, there was like two in particular insurance companies that I kept running into this issue with where I got to freaking know the damn medical director, call the guy again, be like, Hey, it's Boyd again, again, you're not approving this. And it was so goddamn frustrating because it's like, this is, they're, they're basically making a financial decision that's affecting someone's for the rest of their life. And it's, I had it happen with a lot of elderly people. I had it happen with special needs, young people. And I was just like, I'm, I'm done. That's really where the origin of blind spot initially came from. I was like, I'm so freaking done with this, this, this entire industry. I never signed up to be in an industry. I signed up to take care of people. And so when I launched my business, that's when I decided I'm either going to figure out this whole entrepreneurial game and make it work, or I'm going to go do something else. I'll go sell cars or something. Go from a doctor to selling cars? Yeah. That wouldn't be a good idea. Well. I'd open my own business like you did. That's what I, I mean. Did. I can't believe everyone doesn't just go open their own business at whatever they do. Yeah. No matter what. Even if you're not going to operate like an LLC, you have tax advantages. So go operate as an entity. Like if I was working for a, a company, I would still say, pay my company. I'll, I'll show up every day like an employee, but just pay my company. Yeah. That way I got those benefits. What do you think about... Uh, cause people always say there's no money in the cure. So like chemotherapy, yeah. I was doing some research on it the other day, 97% ineffective. So why is it number one? Why is, why are they doing it? If it's so ineffective? Number two, I also was told could be conspiracy. That's the only thing that a doctor can make commission on. Is that true or false? I think that's false in terms of like the commission side of things. Yeah, because I would think, you know, you're telling me that a doctor's pre pre prescribing chemo, knowing it doesn't work to get a commission. Yeah. That, that would make all doctors kind of like evil little fucks. Yeah, no, that's I think that's bullshit there. But I can give some insight behind it because I think someone who's first of all, I mean, there's conspiracy theory folks that uh, they're going to conspire no matter what. So it, it is what it is. Right. But then there's folks that are like, OK, well, I don't really understand how this kind of works. So give me some, some information on that, that I can provide. Okay. So it's not that chemotherapy doesn't always work. It just depends on what it is that you're talking about. Right. So for example, there's, there's some like blood disorders, some blood malignancies that um, there's some chemotherapy that works beautifully about 80% of the time. And it's a pill and it's simple and the side effect profile is really good. And those folks do really, really well. If you talk about something like pancreatic cancer, pancreatic cancer, man, it's, it's a bad deal. Like no matter what, essentially like the, the survival rate is very low. By the way, remember to remind me yeah. to introduce you to Dr. Robert Lyons. Okay. 
His daughter had stage four pancreatic cancer. He was here a couple of days ago on the podcast. Okay. His daughter had stage four pancreatic cancer. Obviously, he freaked. That's his daughter. He had already been working for eight years plus on 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 uh, uh, oxygen therapy, basically. So he figured out, accelerated by the fact that his daughter's got six months to live. The hospital stamped it. I think it was maybe some hospital around this town said, yeah. "You're you're done. You got. You should get your affairs in order." She flew to Hungary. That's where he lives. Mm. Got in these bathtubs filled with oxygen water. They call them it, they call them cocoon. Remember that movie Cocoon? Yeah. The old people jumped in the pool and oh it, yeah. So so they call it cocoon. It's not spelled that way. It's K A Q U N. But anyway, boom. She's still living. Thirteen years later, cancer free. I've sent people down to this spot. There's only one in Las Vegas, uh, but it's basically oxygen water. They're, they're forcing oxygen in. And I said, I always tell the doctor, so you basically cured cancer. He goes, it doesn't cure cancer. And I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? She had cancer. He said, it cures hypoxia, which causes the cancer. So, so like radiation or chemo, he said, because I asked him about chemo. He said, in conjunction with what he does, chemo is way more effective. And more importantly, it repairs quicker. So I want you to get with him because if you ever run into somebody that's got, you know, Lyme disease, cancer, all kinds of problems. Like, dude, he literally showed me yesterday and he has doctors with him, other doctors. Mm -hmm. A girl chopped half her thumb off. You could see a half of a thumb. Okay. Pictures. Yeah. 37 days later, full thumb. No kidding. He said it's got regenerative properties now. Yeah. They're finding more and more about it, but oxygen isn't that crazy? Yes. But you, it's you, but, but here's the thing is that I think that'll cure pan, pancreatic cancer or, or let me say it like this. It'll stop hypoxia which causes all cancer according to him. So I think I think the thing is is that with the your typical medical model is doctors are very much in a box. Right? And I I can I call myself out. I was too. Right. So I was for years, I, I wasn't open to like alternative therapies or anything like that. I was like, no, no, no. This is what I learned in medical school. Therefore, it must be right. And so forth and so on. And where the where the veil was kind of lifted for me was when I was working in the cancer space. I worked for a, a major cancer center for seven years. Can I can I say it? What? Which one it was? You can. I don't care. It's, it, well, I'll just say, you know, it's like if you put a if you put a ham sandwich together, you're probably going to use this oh, spread. No it's, no, it's not that one. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was maybe mayo. No, no, it wasn't oh, mayo. Okay, keep going. Yeah. But I was it's so, irrelevant. Yeah. So I worked, but I, it was, it's one of, there's only like, you know, uh, like less than 10, like major cancer centers. John Hopkins. The country. No, it wasn't Hopkins either. But the, uh, but anyway. UCLA. No. Medical center. No, it's a nationwide one. Okay. But uh, so uh, I remember very vividly we would do these things called morbidity mortality reports. And and what that is, is basically once a patient dies, you you go and basically go back through and say, okay, well, what could we have done differently to maybe have a different outcome? So it's it's done for as an education purpose. And um, so we're there, it was like a Friday morning where we do one of these like once a month. And there's this ridiculous spread. I mean, you walk into this beautiful conference room and here's like from like one side of the room to the other, there's like every like, you know, there's like an omelet station and like, you know, every Danish you can think of and fruits and all this. It was very, very opulent, <clears throat> right? So here I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, this is kind of a, it's kind of a bit much. And I'm, this is the first time that I was really thinking, I was like, that's a lot just to put on this big breakfast station for a freaking meeting, you know? Anyway, so, so we go, we're, we're doing this meeting and um, uh, this was a, I remember the patient that was up was someone that I had gotten to know pretty well. And um, she had died relatively young. And I mean, she was just, a, just a, a beautiful, like nice, kind person, you know? And here we're going through like the images and the labs and the pathology slides and everything. And it was really just reducing this patient just to, you know, just a clinical case, you know? And um, uh, I, I lost my professionalism there for a minute. And um, I slammed my hand down on the table and I said, you know, if we have all this great technology, why in the hell are we not using it to prevent cancer instead of just treat it? What was their answer? So what happened next really pissed me off. There was this 
hush that went across the room. Now I was low on the totem pole. I was just like the primary care doctor there, right? You had these like, you know, medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, all these specialists that came from Ivy League schools that wrote the textbooks on this. I mean, these, these were the tops of the tops in the field. And it's just this blank stare that I got. Maybe a couple people kind of like whispered and snickered back and forth. And it was then that it, I got up, I left the room. And it was then that it dawned on me, there's way more money in treating cancer than there is in preventing it. 100%. It's a business. I, I didn't even see it. And do, you I, think, do you think if you had a cure for cancer, you'd be killed? Uh, dude, that's a, I mean, it's a big, that's, that's, it's a multi-billion dollar business. Yeah, but do you believe if you had a cure for cancer, you, let's put it this way. Yeah. If you've just discovered a cure for cancer where you know any cancer, this will cure it. Yeah. Would you go public with it? I probably wouldn't. Because you'd be afraid I think what would happen is you would be, you'd definitely be a target. You'd lose your license. For, yeah. I mean, there's, you would, you, you may not be killed in the sense of like, you know, sniper. Oh, I think you would be. Maybe. But I mean, I think what would happen is you would be discredited, you know, that they would have, you think about it, like all these pharmaceutical companies and everything. Yeah. They should be messing with like that entire industry. Yeah. I think they'd find a way to discredit you. Well, I just hope I never get it because I will refuse chemo. I've seen chemo do great things for people. I'm, I'm, I'm going with food, but it just depends on the answer is like folks want to make it black and white. It's not. The answer is it depends. Let thy medicine be the food and the food be the medicine. Yes. You want to prevent cancer, change your diet for sure on that. And not only that, sometimes here in the United States where we're allowed to put all this shit in our food, sometimes you can't even help it here. It's true. Literally. Yeah. I had a, I had a buddy of mine, have a girlfriend we went to italy she was lactose intolerant she kept saying she was lactose intolerant lactose intolerant but i'm like oh this is good she but she liked that stuff so she went she started eating it because you know we talked her into it. it was so good had some gelato she was fine yeah she was fine the whole trip she 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 was not lactose intolerant in italy uh -huh. how is that possible here it'll mess her up there it does not yeah it's probably some sort of additive or something it's some sort of bullshit we're allowed to put in yeah. the food absolutely you, you watch these things it's crazy another question i have for you i don't know why i'm asking you but because of the hospital experience yeah why when you go to the hospitals and you look in the cafeteria it's shitty food yeah <laughs> like dude are they trying to get you to come back it seems that way right there's some hospitals i'm looking for protein i'm looking for a source of lean protein a protein shake something i see soda yeah. i see chips i see processed meats i see garbage absolutely yeah. all over and i'm like dude why would a hospital promote this shit food that we all know is not good for you yeah like aren't hospitals there to fix you yes or no i, be, I mean i think it probably comes down to like what's going to sell for the people that are visiting you know i've been in hospitals where there's like a mcdonald's in the lobby you know, I mean, it's, so it's all about business. Yeah, it's about business. That's when I realized when I saw that, I'm like, see, no one gives a shit. Now here. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a peek into the behind the scenes. So when I would, when I was working in the hospital, I'd, I'd work a called a swing shift. So it began at like 4 PM and ended like usually one or two o'clock in the morning. And so I, I'd always be like foraging for food and the shit that they have the, in like the doctor's lounge, it's the same thing. Like you have like soda and chips and you know, there might be like one small wilted salad, you know, uh, at, at the bottom of the refrigerator, but it was, it was junk. Before you were a doctor, what were you? Oh, oh man, that goes back a long time. So um, I had in, in high school and college, I worked in a jewelry store. But did at some point you say, I'm going to go be a doctor. So you went to school to be a doctor. Yeah. So that was, was that everybody was, proud of you, your family? Yeah. Yeah, they were. I mean, because all the parents in the world, you know, they want your their kids to be doctors or, you know, doctors, usually the number one thing a, a parent's most proud of. Yeah. Um, My kid's a doctor. It was. So for me, I like I, I knew from a young age, it's what I wanted to do. But it was the seed was planted in kind of a weird way. So my, when I was a little kid, my, my mom and dad eventually like rekindled and, and got back together. But when I was a little kid, my dad wasn't around. Um, and my mom was, was working. She was a nurse. So I would go and, um, my, my grandfather would basically take me to the hospital, go hang out with my mom when it was like her dinner time. 
So I grew up like, you know, in like intensive care units and things like that in little break rooms that you'd have to walk past, like, you know, patients laying there with like tubes and hoses coming in and out of them, you know? And so there was something that was always very comforting about like the smell of rubbing alcohol and like the beeps of the machines. I, I just had associated with my mom when I was a little kid. So between that and her being a nurse, I think the whole, you know, like medicine seed was probably planted pretty young for so, me. So where did you get the entrepreneur bug? Because you, if you went right into, you know, medical school, yeah. you never really got a chance to be entrepreneurial. Yeah. So um, in part, it was when I was a teenager working in the jewelry store. So I had been mowing lawns when I was like 15, 16. This is in South Florida. And uh, it's freaking hot there, man. So I was like, I was just trying to find a job that I could do with air conditioning, you know? And I uh, had a friend of mine that his parents had just opened a jewelry store and they had come over from Israel. So they, they really didn't speak very good English yet. And so they basically, they, they, they hired me on reluctantly as like a shy stock boy when I was 15. Um, but then they quickly realized, well, wait a minute, he speaks the language, like go get out there. And it was great for me because I was kind of a shy teenager and so it forced me to start learning how to sell and to just talk to people and interact and, and things like that. Things that would serve me way l later in my medical career with my bedside manner and such. So I did that all throughout high school and college. And I mean, I was, I was putting in hours, you know, I was in high school. I'd be, I'd, I'd work like after school on Friday, all day, Saturday, most of the day, Sunday. So when all my buddies were out partying and doing high school kid stuff, I was grinding. You well, know? that's entrepreneurial. Then. Yeah. And so I, I kind of learned that early on and then went and did, you know, the, the typical medicine doctor journey. And so I got to the point where I was fed up and I was like, you know what? Screw this. Like, screw this entire system. I want to do something totally different. And that's when I just started educating myself where I was like, OK, like if if I if I'm going to build, I need to build my way out. How in the hell do you even do that? And especially as when you're, when you're trained in this medical system in the U S is so like enclosed, I had a really hard time, like just kind of breaking out, out of that in the first place, you know, but, um, I looked to, I looked to mentors. I looked to, uh, folks to look up to, you know, like Garrett White, he was one of my mentors that really started down that entrepreneur journey, you know, uh, more recently look to you. You know, I mean, it's, I, I looked to folks that was like, okay, they're not a doctor, but here this, they're an entrepreneur. I didn't even know what the hell an entrepreneur meant a few years ago, you know? So do you know what it means now? I do. I sure as hell know what it means now. The yeah. definition, believe it or not, is someone that takes greater than normal financial risks, especially in business. Yeah. That's the literal definition, which means, you know, most people are entrepreneurs. They, they're just not reaping the rewards from it because you got to take financial risk everywhere. Yeah. Now, um, before we end the show, I told everybody I would tell, tell them what you found and what he found was a condition called penis gigantus, <laughs> but I'm living with it. It'll be fine. I don't think it's that serious. And I think, um, you know, I'll be okay. You're, you can never fall forward. You're like a human tripod. I can never fall forward. <laughs> That's right. Even though that, that is technically how you succeed quicker. You fall forward. Yes. Fast. Fast. Most yes. people don't understand that premise. Yep. Like, why would I want to fail? Well, you fail. So you learn quicker. So then you can adjust and boom, try again and then learn quicker and then adjust. But most people are so afraid to fail. They just sit there. They don't do anything. You weren't like that. You said, screw this nonsense. This is basically fraud. If you ask me like, dude, that what you're explaining to me, like that's fraud. That's blatant fraud. That's why I think everybody should go to jail sometimes. Like, dude, if you know for a fact I could save you, but I'm, but you know, that's not necessarily what I'm allowed to do. It's just like the whole, you know, pandemic that just went through. Like, dude, that was a scam demic. That was bullshit. People should go to jail for that. I believe like that is not okay. They were I mean, now it's coming out with like Elon and the Twitter files that they were suppressing information on purpose for not just political, but definitely for the old pandemic, yeah. which was political. Those people should go to jail, dude. There's a lot of people that lost their lives because of that. There was people that ruined their careers over that. There's people that got fired because they wouldn't take a vaccine that was mandated. Are you crazy? That's never happened in the history of the world, has it? Someone says, yeah, it has. Back when, you know, there was, I forget, the Spanish flu or some shit. Or smallpox. They yeah, or like something. Back in the 60s. Or something yeah, but like, like back then was a different time, dude. Yeah, it was a different time, yeah. So I don't know what to believe, you know? So here's what I'd say. Every day I wake up, 
I'm extremely excited to be in the world, regardless of the condition. And I know that with that gratitude and the ability to control my reactions, right? My reactions, I'm technically in control because people say, well, you can't change that. You can't control all this shit. Yeah, but you can control how you react to it. hundred percent. So you get good news. You can react to it. You get bad news. You can react to it. You wake up, you open your eyes. You already got the, the best news ever, which is you get another day. Get another and, one. and the whole one, the whole day is not even promised. So why not let that excite you and instantly get you fired up? That's what every entrepreneur should be thinking. Yeah. And then next, every entrepreneur should be thinking, Hey, I'm glad I heard this episode today. I'm going to get a hold of Dr. David Boyd work with David work with Dr. Boyd. Dot com. Everyone should go check that site out. If nothing else, just tell them, hello, tell them the bomb squad sent you. Thanks man. But some of you guys, uh, especially where are you in Scottsdale? Yeah. Scottsdale, Phoenix area. That's where you are going. No matter what, if you're there already, dude, I'd definitely go visit. Where do they follow you on social media? Uh, so on Instagram is David Boyd, MD, David Boyd, MD, B O Y D folks. Yep. MD. Go follow him on Instagram. You're dropping nuggets. You're given all kinds of, of of nuggets. Are they are they health nuggets? I don't know if they're health. They're nuggets. kind of entrepreneurial life, life nuggets. entrepreneurial nuggets. But I'm mean, the bottom line is this: you're like a life you're like a life doctor now. Yeah, it's kind of which is I mean to me it just makes sense because it's all one anyway, you know. And that's really what at the crux of it, you know the the thing is is that entrepreneurs are the people that change the world. And that that when I when I when I made that realization and I didn't understand it until I actually became an entrepreneur. I was like, you think about the products that you use every, like everything in this studio, everything in someone's, there's an entrepreneur behind all of that. And so entrepreneurs are the ones that change the world. Government's not coming to save you. Nobody's coming to save you. So if you have entrepreneurs that are all in that similar mindset where it's like, Hey, listen, we have to be the best version of ourselves so that we can create the jobs. We can create the products. We can create the services and go and make like the world a better place collectively. That's when actually some shit can happen. And that's what fires me up and gets me going. So being the doctor that takes care of those people that then goes and takes care of other people in their own particular way. That's what I love to do. I was told that because I know a bunch of chiropractors, we got, we have a, a obviously a training system that, mm -hmm. that a lot of chiropractors use through a company called activator. And then there's another one. Anyway, a lot of chiropractors. I always used to make fun of chiropractors just because I know it bothered them. I'm sure it would did because they call themselves doctor this and doctor that. And I'm like, oh, you're a chiropractor, so you're not a real doctor? And, the, and you know, they'd always flip. And they're like, actually, no, but I've discovered something about chiropractors. They learn as much as a doctor except for, and the reason why they don't go as long, prescriptions. Is that true? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's that's true. I mean, go ask them. So, yeah. so in other words, they're doctors. They just don't have to learn prescriptions because they're not allowed to prescribe. I think they, I mean, I think, I think chiropractors can prescribe like muscle relaxants. It's like, they has to be within their scope. I could be po wrong though. I don't po know. Point I'm making is like, I didn't know that. So like they are full blown doctors. They're, 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 they're just not prescribers. Now the, the, in my mind might be a little conspiracy ish. The pharmaceutical companies, they're the ones that don't want you dead. Like everyone says, mm. they want you sick. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, here's a medicine. And then that medicine causes something else. And then, oh, we can solve that here. And then that causes something else. And it's like, they try to keep you sick as long as you're alive. That's why I don't take Tylenol. I don't take medicine. Now, again, would I? Yes. Have I? Yes. But I don't just take med. I don't take Tylenol because I have a headache. Yeah. Which coincidentally, I've rarely had a headache if, if ever. Like, see, I'm as lucky as they get. That's why, dude, we got to keep an eye on me. Yeah. Because, dude, I'm as lucky as they get. Like, I, I don't have pain. I don't have joint pain. I don't have arthritis. I don't have back aches. I don't have, you know, body damage. I'm not broke down. I've been lucky my entire life, and I've always felt good. Well, let's see how long we can keep that streak going. Which, by the way, is crazy because my wife, she's the opposite. She had Crohn's, you know, she's, she's like the other day I was, I got up too fast and I was a little bit dizzy and I said, Whoa, I feel a little bit dizzy. Like that's weird. She goes, welcome to my world. I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, I'm dizzy all the, all the time. I'm like, babe, that's not good. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. Yeah. Like don't, you got to get checked out, but, but she doesn't, she's like a trooper. I, on the other hand, fuck, I want to get checked out. I want to know what's going on. I want to make sure I maintain my health. 
period. Yeah, right. Because when you look at what's important in life, you got, in my, in my mind, three things. Number one, and I'm not talking about God. God's a relationship, so it fits in relationship. But if you put God first, great, put God first. But you want to put health first. Okay. Then, because if you don't have that, dude, you're screwed. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you lose your health, dude, you'll trade everything you got to get it back. That's the thing is that people will, they want to spend pennies on prevention, but they would give their life savings for the cure. Exactly. This is the reason why, like, like most folks don't go visit a cancer center if they don't have cancer, but the majority of cancer centers, for example, have RV hookups behind the cancer center. Because folks have gone and had to like sell their house, sell everything they have and go live in an RV and park it out back so they can walk back and forth getting constant. Out. Yeah. Constant treatments. So health is, is that important. So I would do preventative and focus on your health. Then I'd focus on relationships because if, if you do lose your health, those people aren't worried about their Ferraris and their watches and their bullshit. They're worried about relationships. Yep. So I'd focus on relationships, which coincidentally get you more money. The right relationships get you the right money. Mm -hmm. And then I would focus on the third one, money. Mm -hmm. People always go, Oh, you ruined it, Brad. You shouldn't focus on money. Mm -hmm. Yes, you should. Because that money, believe it or not, will get you more relationships and it'll get you more health. Absolutely. The the money will get you the other two. And those are the most important things ever. Other than when people say, well, what about God? Well, to me, God's a relationship. Yeah. So, so I, I, that, that falls into that, but Hey, somebody says that you put God first. Great. Put God first. Then you put your health. Then you put relationships. Those are the most important. And then third is money. So you can get better health and better relationships. That's the only reason it's third. Yeah. Well said. Like you, you, you look at this. There you go. Give myself a damn bomb. Damn right. You think of it this way. Like, is it a coincidence that like you look at like, you look at monarchies, you look at um, senators, presidents, there's a reason why these folks live as long as they do. It's not just good genes. It's because they have a they have access to a different healthcare system than everybody else does. They have Dr. David Boyd's running around. Well, I'm not taking care of those folks. But no, but they've got someone like you. They've got someone like me. And they're not doing stupid tests. They're doing full blown tests. Hundred percent. Like when Trump got COVID, dude, he was getting the best care ever in the history of the world. Yeah, exactly. And it was gone in like, you know, two days or something like that. Yeah. You know, and, you know, it was supposed to kill everybody. Uh huh. But yeah. you know. That's what I mean. So like there's, that's what most folks don't understand. And that, you know, I I really try to preach to the entrepreneurial community is like you have coach, you have first class, and then you have private. Now, first class is nice. Like coach is pretty much the generic like experience that everybody has with their, you know, their typical medical insurance and so forth. Right. First class is like your typical concierge doctor. You pay this guy a retainer. You still use your insurance. You get a little bit better service, a little bit more time. And then you can go private. Well, coaching first class, it's like the plane, it, it takes off and lands at a certain time. You go private, you go when you want. And you, there is no red tape, you know? There's no two hour wait times. Mm-mm. And that's, that's what I offer is I offer that private medical piece. There also, there also isn't, there also isn't like other sick people. Like I don't like going to the emergency room. There's other sick people yeah, in there. people coughing on you and everything. I don't like it. Yeah. I'd rather have a concierge doctor or go full blown private. Yep. There you go. So is that, is that basically in a nutshell blind spot medical? Yeah, we basically, so it starts off with the ultimate human analysis, the executive physical. We find whatever problems that we find, we address those. And then we take a step back and, you know, I, I don't invite every person to become one of my private patients because we have to, I, I want people that are going to stay, you know, you know, it's just, just that simply. Like, I don't want folks that are going to, you know, come for a year and then leave. And, and frankly, what I found. Plus you have so, you only have so much time. Yeah, you know, only so much time. So why wouldn't you want to have, like, have a patient that's the same person you want to be friends with, right? Like if yeah. you're going to spend your time, it should be mutual, right? So, so those folks that are a good fit, that's when we stop and we say, okay, what do you want to build in the next year? You know, you want, if, if you're a $5 million guy and you want to go to a $10 million guy, that's a different guy. That's a different set of problems. It's a different set of stress, et cetera. Right? Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. Mm-hmm. Stress, dude. Yeah. The people that are out there listening that don't really feel like they stress, like I don't stress, dude. I don't stress at all. In my mind, I don't stress. I don't stress. It's the craziest shit. I mean, I have stressed on occasion, but I don't stress generally. But whatever the shit you found, which is some sort of enlarged aorta or something. Yes you said came from stress. Mm -hmm. So someone that doesn't even feel like they stress 
is stressing. Talk about that for a second, because sure. there's a lot of people out there that are probably like me going, dude, I don't stress. I'm fine. I'm, you know, I, I don't freak out because I don't. Yeah. I, I but you're still freaking out and stress is a silent killer. Precisely. And so I would say it's that you just are really good at coping with it. You know, that you, you handle your stress in a way where you're not losing your shit, like throwing things. Well, apparently my blood pressure goes up and I, and I expand aortas. Yeah. So you're like a pressure cooker. Right. And, 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 you know, you never know in, in my mind, you never know what caused it could have been born that way. Admit it. I could have been, I, I mean, there, there could have been, could have been. Yeah. I, I can't, I can't go back with a crystal ball and, yeah, know. but I mean, I could have been, there could be like, dude, there's nothing wrong and there never, never will be nothing wrong. You were born that way. And when you check in a year, it's going to be the same size. Cause it's, but you were born that way. Maybe so. And maybe that's why I can run so far yeah. with it without getting winded. Maybe that's why I'm almost like a superhuman. My, my aorta is a little bit it's larger your, than yeah. most. Yeah. So you can, you can, you can just like them. my penis gigantus. Right. They're the two are probably connected. They might be. Though. Yeah. I mean, like, blood vessel wise, they have to be connected. They're both blood vessels. Yes. Or no, one's a, one's a, one's a artery. Yeah. And one is a member. Yeah. Corpus cavernosum. That's really good that you remember this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and frenulum. Yeah. Dude, I'm, and by the way, guys, don't don't freak out. He didn't play with my nuts. Thankfully, it's <laughs> you're going inside. You're taking pictures. You're going inside, like you know, MRI, CT, freaking you know, cameras inside where nobody looks. That's why it's called blind spot. Doctor, appreciate you coming in. Oh, thank you, thank you for and, having me. And folks, I'll be having him back because I'm gonna uh, try to see if I qualify to be his, you know, permanent dude. So you'll you'll he'll be coming back more often especially if there's anything going wrong with me because because i'll keep you guys in the loop appreciate you coming in thank you for having guys me. go to him work with dr boyd.com follow him on social media david boyd md until next time keep it real dropping bombs with the real bradley subscribe now